I mean, perhaps, Mr. Chair, you were spoiled for choice, obviously. <laughs> um, I, I want to talk about part two, and having given a relatively positive uh, uh, speech in part one, I'm, I'm now going to press to the opposite of my colleague, Mr. Jones, and, and be a little bit more negative about this, because I think that as we've gone through the debate, and Leanne Dalziel has put up her uh, amendments, uh, and the Minister has responded to them largely in a negative way, uh, that, that highlights my concern which is that we do have an agreement in principle here that the a Productivity Commission is a good thing. It's something that we think will be very useful for the future of New Zealand. But its usefulness in part will be about its durability to, in terms of being able to cope with the changing uh, uh, fortunes of, of political parties and, and some of the different agendas that are being pursued by political parties. And I think that the, the changes that the Andalusia has brought forward, uh, in particular the one to Clause 12, is an example of where the durability of this Productivity Commission could be enhanced. And that's the notion of, of effectively developing the idea of social partnership within uh, the Productivity Commission's terms of reference. And I, I don't think on this side of the House we find it quite surprising, actually, that the current government has not chosen to pursue the tripartite work that was going on in the skills area. Uh, and obviously the skills strategy that Business New Zealand and the Council of Trade Unions have put, put, uh, worked with the government on was a successful strategy. It was an example of social partnership in action. And skill development and the enhancement of skill, as my colleague Shane Jones has said, productivity is about people. The, one of the key drivers to productivity is enhancing skills and inclu increasing training. Why this government has chosen not to invest further in, in the skills strategy and indeed in keeping the skills forum going is of great surprise to us. So from our point of view, th this, um, this amendment to Clause 12 is actually about ensuring that there's some durability and that there is some inclusion and involvement of the key participants in terms of this case of workplace productivity but of productivity generally in New Zealand, the Council of Trade Unions and Business New Zealand. And I think it is of great concern to us on this side of the House that the, that the government isn't prepared to pick up this kind of idea because it does then make us wonder about, about the scope and how the Commission will be used because there's an awful lot of power in the hands of the responsible ministers. And of course that's as it should be. Parliament sovereign, the ministers of the executive who, who, who come to us and we, we, chat, we hold to account and, and the elected representatives should be controlling the direction of, of, of this work. But we want the Commission to be able to work as broadly and as, and as inclusively as it can and we want the Commission to be able to challenge the government and to challenge the, all of the ideas and concepts that any government is putting forward, but in particular the government of the day. So it is disappointing, Mr Chair, from our point of view, that, that there hasn't been a, a willingness among the government to pick up Clause 12, but perhaps we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised because the government has largely ignored things in the skills area where that, where that social partnership programme was working really very well indeed. And of course there have been other issues around skill development, uh, uh, the cuts to adult and community education for instance, uh, the restriction on tertiary education places. None of that bodes especially well for, for a commitment to, to the core element of productivity, that of raising skills. But the, the opportunity that's here for, for the government to pick up the Andalusia's amendment and actually get Business New Zealand and the Council of Trade Unions on board. And, and I don't buy um, um, Sam Lotoinga's argument that um, somehow or other this could be difficult because the names might change or anything like that. We change things all the time in, in law when that, when that takes place. This is actually about embedding social partnership in the Productivity Commission and it is very disappointing that the, uh, the government has chosen not to pick that up. I want to go back from, from Clause 12 to um, the whole question of the membership of the Commission, which has been alluded to by um, a number of members, um, and this is under, under Clause 10. And I actually draw here on the example of the Treasury Board that was recently put in place by um, Treasury uh, Secretary John Whitehead, no doubt with um, talking to, to Finance Minister Bill English. And there was a great palaver about how this was going to be this excellent example of how uh, Treasury would be able to reflect the community's uh, interests and, and those who are affected by the, by the fiscal policies and the overall policy framework that the Treasury is responsible for. And the Treasury Board came out and it was just the usual suspects. The usual uh, board members, the professional board members, 
One of them in particular we had concerns about that, that person's links actually with, with the sort of broader National Party. But generally speaking, the, the people who were appointed represented a very narrow... Mr Chair, Mr Chair... I call Grant Robertson. Thank you very much, Mr Chair. They, they represented a very narrow range of people. They certainly didn't represent the broader community. And I think our concern when we look at, at Clause 10 around the membership of the Commission, as, as others have said, is that Mr Sherwin's early appointment doesn't bode well. He reflects somebody who of a particular ideological mindset. But more than anything else, I think he, he represents a narrow idea of what this Commission could do. I think... As with the Treasury Board and with the Commission, we should be thinking broadly. And I remember thinking when the Treasury Board was being appointed, what about appointing someone like Diane Robertson, the Auckland City Missioner? What about saying, we actually care about the impact of the Treasury's policies on real people? As, as Shane Jones said, not the big end of town, the other end of town. And I really would encourage um, uh, the Minister as we go forward in this process that we actually find a way of getting a Commission that is reflective of the very broad nature of productivity that we've been talking about tonight. But again, it doesn't bode well that the question of social partnership is dismissed so quickly, because I'm quite sure then that when we look at the Commission's membership, um, that'll be a concern. And that's been a concern, I know, for a number of members of the Labour caucus. We support the idea in principle, but we've got concerns about the way it's going to be implemented. And certainly Mr Sherwin's appointment is a very bad start in that regard, uh, Mr Chair, and we want to make sure, as the Commission is appointed in full, that, that it doesn't fall into all of that trap. I want to refer in, the, in my remaining time, Mr Chair, to the, uh, the other amendments that uh, Leanne Dalziel has put forward, um, particularly around the purpose of the Commission. Uh, I think she's correct to identify, in particular, the idea of practical activities. I think that's actually something that the Commission could really usefully take up. And there's been some very good work done by the Partnership Resource Centre out of the Department of Labour in the last few years. This was an initiative set up by the Fifth Labour Government, and, and it's drawn together the skills of people from the union movement and from the private sector around how to improve, improve workplace productivity. And it's a very interesting... Uh, what's that? Not much on the website, Mr Young, so we'll have to have a look at that. I can certainly introduce Mr Young to some of the people who've been involved in it. And, it, and there are some private sector uh, outfits, and I know that um, Air um, New Zealand and one or two others have been involved who've really enjoyed their, their links with the Partnership Resource Centre. Let, let's actually broaden out this definition here so that both practical activities, the, the like pilot projects that the Partnership Resource Centre undertakes around productivity, could actually be part of the Commission's work. So I, I think Leanne Dalziel is exactly on to the right point there. Um, and, and then again, when in the amendment that comes in under number nine, uh, Clause 9 around productivity projects, that this is actually where the Commission could have uh, a more detailed mandate, a more detailed ability to, to, a more practical ability to take on these projects. And I think it is, it is unfortunate that the Minister has ruled out uh, uh, accepting those amendments because I do think they broaden out. Research, yes, absolutely. The inquiries, obviously, that's what we want um, done here. But we do need to start moving that beyond, uh, a little beyond that to some practical projects that, that, that could be taken up. So, so Mr Chair, in conclusion on, on my, on my uh, contribution at this time on part, uh, part two, I would say that uh, part two contains some very good uh, points, but there are a number of clauses here that I think could be uh, enhanced. And if we don't get this right, then the Productivity Commission runs the risk of being seen as pursuing a particular agenda. I hope it's not Mr Sherwin's old agenda. It shouldn't be, because we all believe that this is a good idea. We need to give the framework to ensure that a productivity commission can be durable across governments and has the ability to undertake practical work in, a, in, a, in developing social partnerships. That's missing from part two at the moment, and it disappoints me, because in general I think this is a very, very good idea. I call Katrina Shanks. Thank you, Mr Chair. I